insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 106, Perspectives, part one. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my insightful and intelligent co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. Uh, Anything exciting happened this week? Um, well, so far, I had my math quiz and my science test. Did pretty good? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think I'd get, I think I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I got a 100 on the science test, and I'm pretty sure I did good on the math test. Good. Kind of, kind of what we expect. Uh, not to set unrealistic expectations, but you, you always tend to deliver on these tests and quizzes. For the most part, yeah. So this week is kind of a Q&A session. We've done a number of those in the past. The Q&A sessions we've done in the past have kind of been get-to-know-you, fun, question-and-answer type things. Mm -hmm. This week's a little bit different. So when we had originally come up with the concept of this podcast, the idea was to get the perspective of a teenager on various topics of the day. And, you know, we would delve into individual topics and do research and try to educate the audience and ourselves and and stuff like that. But we never really did the perspectives type thing until now. It took us 106 episodes to actually get to what this podcast was supposed to be about. Yeah. So today we've got three sets of questions, 10 questions each, and each set of questions is focused in a specific area. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about academic questions, politics, and what I termed as big picture type questions. Okay. Uh, And this is the first of two parts. We've got another one lined up uh, for next week, another set of uh, 10 questions of three different categories. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to ask you these questions, and some of these questions you might not know. You might not have a perspective on or opinion on. And, you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit more detail about some of the things that uh, that we ask you here. But really, it's just a matter of getting your input and how you see the world through the eyes of a 14-year-old. Okay. All right. But before we do that, I do want to uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get us uh, all of our video shows for all of our shows are available If you look for Insights into Things, audio versions of this podcast can be found as Insights into Teens. You can find this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, pretty much any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite folks to reach out to us, give us your feedback. We're always looking for show suggestions and and feedback on what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we're at instagram.com slash insights into things. We can get links to all those and give us feedback directly through our main webpage at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready to get started? I think we are. All right, here we go. So the first topic that we're going to discuss is academics. And this is stuff about colleges and 
what you do in school and, and pretty much everything that's confined to school life. So the first question that I have here is, do colleges put too much stock in standardized tests? What do you think? Um, well, I definitely think that um, certain colleges probably, um, a lot of colleges do use standardized tests as a way to kind of figure out if they want the student to if they want to have the student apply or if they want to accept the student. Uh, we talked a couple episodes ago about GPA and how lots of colleges, uh, some colleges only allow students with a certain GPA. And I think in some aspects, they might put a little too much pressure on it because you can still, like, you you don't have to have a good GPA to be a good student. You can have other, there are other areas I'm sure that students would be good at. And in cer- in some ways, I would say certain um, colleges do put a bit too much onto the standardized test scores. But also colleges are also looking for um, extracurricular things. Right. So... I'd say that it's kind of an in-between thing, and it really depends on the college you look at. Right. And when we, when we talk about standardized tests, we're talking about the SATs and the ACTs, which aren't necessarily a reflection of your GPA. Yeah. So your GPA is another statistic that you're coming into even after you take these tests. Mm-hmm. And these standardized tests can be, you know, frankly, they can be burdensome. I mean, there's, there's a cost to taking the tests. Uh, sometimes you have to travel to a testing center to take them. You wind up taking uh, practice tests in order to prep for them. And a lot of times the materials that are on these tests aren't necessarily things that are relevant to your course study when you go to college. Uh, in doing a little bit of research, I found an article on U.S. News and World Report where they talked about a report from a group of influential experts who recommend that colleges re-examine their admissions and merit aid policies and consider admitting students without the use of scores from standardized te- standardized tests such as the SAT or the ACTs. So there is a kind of a grassroots movement to sort of move away from that because they are colleges are looking for more well-rounded students, not people that are just very good at taking this one specific test. Yeah. So I I think I would tend to agree with your opinion on that one. Okay. The next question here is, is cheating. And we've, we've done a whole podcast on cheating in the past. It happens, you know, there's, there's certainly no way to, you can't honestly say it doesn't happen, but the question here is, do you think that cheating in, and we'll, we'll confine it to grade school or high school in this case, do you think cheating is out of control? Well, when I was in school, um, I would say that cheating wasn't really out of control because we always had, um, I don't know what to call them, blockers, I think they were called, where we would block off from everyone when we were taking a test. And there were harsh punishments for students who cheated on exams, so... And I'm assuming that high school kind of has the same thing. So I'd say that cheating then wasn't really out of control. I'm assuming that now, since everybody's kind of online, cheating can kind of get a little more out of hand and it's a little less um, in the school. But the school also is able to... The teachers are also able to see what the students are doing online, so we're getting somewhere from where we first started when I was in seventh grade. So, I'd say cheating's not ent- not really out of control right now. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. I hadn't even thought about the question in relation to the schooling at home scenario. So, the next question deals with test scores in general. And the question is, are test scores a good indication of a school, a student's competency? And, and a lot of the reason I ask this is there's a, when I was in school, 
your entire academic achievement was tied to tests. And in recent years, there's sort of been this development, this push or recognition, I should say, that some students don't take tests well. So in order to be fair to those people, we have to find some other way to determine whether or not they're retaining the knowledge that, that the school is trying to impart, impart on them. So the question here is, are test scores a good indication of a school of students' competency? I don't entirely think it's, um, you should really depend entirely on test scores because whenever students are normally taking a test, a lot of them are kind of stressed by, by those kinds of tests and, um, their anxiety can sometimes get in the way of that jeopardizing their score. So, I think you need to look more at their performance rather than a test because having just one, like, you can still have a group of questions um, related to what they've learned over the months that they've been in your class. I just wouldn't say focus entirely on that. Like, maybe have an assignment that deals with all the questions and have the students give the student, like, time to work on them. Because when the day of a test, students, most students are anxiety-induced, and I also don't think that tests, um, kind of reflect everything, because, um, students also have, um, other create, like, for extracurricular activities, for example, um, it's kind of hard to take a, it's kind of hard, it's kind of hard to do a test score on them, especially with art, because art is a lot, is really based on creativity, and it's, and you can kind of apply that in a way to other areas, um, cause, like I said, um, tests, uh, get students anxiety based and they don't entirely perform as well as they probably would if they weren't stressed into having a test. So I'd say just look at their performance over time instead of um, t making them take a test um, and using the test scores to determine um, how well they do. And, and you know, I think that's, that's probably a <clears throat> a more logical approach to it because you think about it in the real world. I don't have tests at my job. Yeah. You know, if, if there's a question of whether or not I'm competent at my job, it's about how I perform my job, whether it's project management, hiring new employees, managing employees, doing a technical chore, whatever it is, I'm not taking a written test to do my job. So when I'm evaluated for an annual evaluation, it's based on my on-the-job performance, which is no different than what you're suggesting here is that, you know, whether or not the student retains that information is something that you should be able to determine based on how they do their assignments throughout the year. So <clears throat> I think that's a, a very interesting point you make. So... The next one's kind of a little off the wall and, and not one that you've had exposure to. <clears throat> so you're going to kind of have to put your theoretical hat on for this one. Are there benefits to attending a single sex school? Meaning as a female, would there be a benefit to you attending an all girls school where you're not mixing with boys and girls? Well, I can definitely see benefits for certain people like i could definitely see that it would kind of stop from someone who might like someone who's harassed by the opposite sex because of the battle because there's the battle of the sexes still kind of going on and that and especially we've all I'm pretty sure in elementary school we've kind of experienced the uh, boys are better than girls or girls are better than boys. And I think maybe when they're younger, it might be better to separate them. Um, but still, I think that same sex school, like, I think that including every, every, um, 
sex and gender in a school isn't a bad thing, but and that if you do want to have a go to a single sex school, it's totally fine. There are there can be benefits to it if you have experienced problems with the opposite sex. So I would say that there's really no problem. It's really just up to the student if they want to attend and if they feel it would be better for them. Okay, fair enough. Personal preference. I can totally understand that. So the next one's another kind of theoretical one because you don't really do sports a lot. Does participation in sports keep teens out of trouble or is there a perception that it keeps teens out of trouble? Well, I can definitely see that it could probably keep teens out of trouble. Um, just uh, one of my assignments for Jim this week was actually reading an article about how physical fitness um, affects and um, um, benefits uh, the teenage brain. And um, there's a lot of benefit to um, playing sports. Kids learn um, beneficial Uh, they learn beneficial top. Uh, I don't know what to call them. Like there's certain benefits that, that you get from sports. Yeah, like you know, socializing, learning teamwork, right, that kind of thing. And I can definitely say that it won't entirely keep them out of trouble because some kids who are in sports can still kind of get into trouble. Um, but it is, but it is a good way to um give your teen some positive benefits that could potentially keep them out of trouble. Okay, that makes sense. So the next question that we have is one that all teens absolutely love, and it's about homework. So do you think homework is harmful or helpful to the student? It really depends on the student, in my opinion. Um, if the student is... if I can definitely say that the extra practice for certain students can definitely be helpful and it can help them improve their grade. But for some students who, um, who get stressed by the amount of homework that they get, it can definitely be harmful to them to have to do more homework than they can possibly manage. So it really depends on the student themselves. Um, it can benefit someone who needs the extra practice um, and even um, help them learn other skills like time management, um, wor um, working on independent work. But for students who have struggle managing their time and homework isn't really helping it, it can be harmful to them. I, I would tend to agree. I think homework is something that is subjective and and something that's situational um it's it's you know homework is we spoke you spoke of anxiety previously with the test homework can be just as anxiety generating as tests you know kids get home they need to relax they need time to relax and and unwind and do recreational things and when you're loaded up with homework when you get home that's something that can really eat into you and cause more anxiety and in, in the long run can cause more harm than good. Uh, next one, and this is kind of an interesting one here. So your teachers grade you based on your performance. Should students be allowed to grade their teachers based on their teacher's performance? Hmm. Honestly, I've never actually thought of that before. Um... Hmm. I mean, I definitely think some students can probably jeopardize it and say that their teacher's bad even when they're really not because they can feel like, oh, she's torturing me, she's giving too much homework, and it's like, really? So the vindictive student. Yeah, I... It's just, I'm not entirely sure if some students are emotionally mature enough to handle that kind of stuff. That's a good point. Um, but there are, I definitely think there are some students who could, I just don't really see the point in really grading your teacher's performance. Like I get if you have like a really bad teacher grading their performance might be able to fix it. 
Um, but I still really don't see much purpose in that. Well, and I think the impetus for this question is a lot of teachers' performance is based on their students' performance. So if your students don't perform well, it reflects on you poorly as a teacher. So if your students could be part of that evaluation process and and get feedback from the students to the, the, the school about whether or not the teacher's doing their job, are they attentive, are they compassionate, do they do they uh, do their work? Do they do the, you know, are they putting forth the effort needed to, to teach this to students? Uh, I think all of that wouldn't be the sole factor in determining uh, a teacher's performance, but it would be a contributing factor along with the, the performance of your students and their attendance and everything else that goes into their performance now. Okay. Yeah, I think it would be a bad idea to have the, t- the students be the sole judge of whether, <laughs> whether a teacher's Doing a good job or not. Yeah. Uh, at that point, you, you, you got students that are blackmailing their teachers. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on to some, some college questions. Um, so the first one that we have here is about the cost of college. So before I ask the question, I want to throw out some numbers here. So for the 2017, and this information comes from uh, the uh, – uh, I didn't write it down. It's uh, the National Education Association. So for the 2017 and 18 academic year, the annual dollar price for undergraduate tuition, room, and board, so that's to stay on college campus and get educated, were estimated to be just under 18000 for public institutions a little over 46000 for a private nonprofit and a little over 26000 for a public, a private for-profit institution. Then what we saw, and that's, you know, the most recent time frame. So for comparison purposes, between the 2007 and 8 year and the 2017 and 18 year, you know, in that 10-year time frame, there was roughly a 30% increase in tuition over the course of 10 years. So with that said, you know, we haven't picked the college yet or anything, so we don't know which of these types of institutions that you're going to go to if you go to one. Do you think, based on these numbers, that the cost of college is too high? Well, I'd say that... I don't think the prices should be increasing as much as they have. So I think that the, like, I get that the price, that colleges pay a lot of money to have the technology and the resources for students. And of course, they need to make the money back. But there are, there is a certain, um, I feel as though there's a little, there's a little too much money that the students are expected to give to the colleges, especially at an increasing rate of what we have as 31% in 10 years. So I'd say that don't have the price increasing as much because um, we all, I'm pretty sure, most people who have gotten out of college pay a lot of were were really in debt when they were done um and there's and i just feel as though it's a little too much money to um have uh students pay for it so i'd say tone it down a bit fair enough i would as a parent who's about to send a child to college in a few years i would totally agree So let's talk college admissions. Now, we talked briefly about what was involved in college admissions when we did our GPA episode. And we talked about how competitive it could be. How You know, certain colleges that are choice colleges only have a certain number of slots. And they're very selective in who they allow into their colleges. Do you think overall that the college admissions process is too competitive? 
Well, probably for the colleges that have all that have very few entries, it can probably be a bit too competitive in that sense. But for the colleges that pretty much accept almost anyone, I'd say there's not really much room for competition there. Um, and but for colleges that have very few slots. Yeah, it can probably get a bit competitive between a lot of people, especially if they're trying to go to the same college and one gets accepted and the other doesn't. So, okay, so that leads us into our last question in this segment here, and that's about competition. And and we're talking not just competition in, in college admissions, but competition in general in school. Is competition a good thing? Um... As long as it doesn't go too far, I'd say. Um, I definitely think that competition um, is important for people. Um, it's important for students to learn that um, I don't th- I wouldn't say that competition is too bad as long as it doesn't go to the extremes. Um, competition can teach uh, like especially if you're on a team, think of sports, um, it it teaches you how to work with your team members in order to beat the other team. Um, and as long as everyone realizes that no, that even though one side won, it doesn't mean that the other side is any was did any less work, did any um, didn't do as well. Just because didn't the other, put in as much effort. Yeah, um, I definitely think as long as they know that. Um, both teams put an equal amount of effort in towards winning, then I think it's fine. But there is times when competition can get too competitive and people can start rubbing it in other people's faces and it can get sore winners and sore losers. There's definitely a dark side to competition. I agree with you there. Yeah. That was all we have for this segment. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and we're going to get your perspective on politics. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We are talking teen perspectives on politics. So some of these questions here, again, we have 10 questions. Some of these might be ones you're not uh, very comfortable or, or affluent or fluent in answering. Uh, and I don't want to lead you one way or the other. So I'm just going to ask them and get your, your take on them. So question one is, is our election process fair? I'd say for the most part it is. It's a decently secure system, I would think. Um, and I don't think it really tries to go one way or the other, and it's really just up to the voters, in a sense. So, I'd say for the most part it's pretty fair. Okay. How about our taxation system? Do you think we have a fair system of taxation? Could you describe it a bit more to me? Well, let's talk income tax, for instance. You know, income tax, depending on how much you make, the more you make, the higher percentage you pay in taxes. Is that fair, or should we have a flat tax across the board where everyone pays 10% of whatever they make? Um, I... I know that there's... I know that there's a lot of people who are going to say that that we should have it one way or another, 
but I think so far it's fine. Um, I think that the bigger amount that you make, the higher your income, the the higher you have to pay in taxes, um, is fair enough because because I definitely don't think that having a straight on tax would be the most fair option in my opinion. Honestly, it's really subjective when you think about it this way because some people might think that, oh, we really shouldn't have it the same way, but then other people are going to be like, well, we should well, we should have it the same way, and I'm pretty sure it's really just it's really a sub, it's really subjective. Um I'll buy that. So let's talk law enforcement, not politics, but still government entities. Do you think that law enforcement cameras like body cams and dash cams are an invasion of privacy? Um, I wouldn't say it that much. Like, if you try to get into an airport, I I don't think it's really an invasion of privacy. It's really just for safety. Um... As long as they, like, don't invade your personal privacy, um, I think it's fine. Um, they're really just trying to check if it's safe, and they really don't care what you're carrying in your suitcase or anything like that. It's just making sure you don't have anything bad. Okay. By that. Um, should government have a say in our diets? Definitely not. You eat how you... The government shouldn't control how you want to eat. You want to eat healthy. You want to. You don't want to eat healthy. You want to be somewhere in the middle. It should be up to you. The government... If the government were to control that, then I'm pretty sure a lot of people would have a problem with that. And I really don't think that controlling our food is something the, um, the government should have a say in. Okay. You seem to have a very strong opinion about that. Good for you. Um, so you haven't run into this yet, but I think you'll probably run into it a little bit more in high school. Should the military be allowed to recruit in high schools? Uh, I kind of don't like the feeling of that. Like, I don't, I feel as though you should be at least 21 to be recruited under the army. I don't feel comfortable having teenagers. Um, well, you have to be 18 at least. That's the legal age. Yeah. So you're looking at them trying to recruit seniors in high school. Yeah. Yet it, I, I still don't feel comfortable with 18-year-olds. I say 21 is probably the oldest I feel comfortable with. I just feel as though um, the seniors are still a little young and I know that people used to recruit like 14 year olds for war and I I don't really feel comfortable with the fact that seniors who are who are only 18 are getting recruited into the military okay. I yeah I feel it would be better if they were just 21 okay that's that's perfectly fair to have that opinion do you think the government should provide free health care? Other countries do. Canada does. The UK does. A lot of European countries, you get your health care for free. Do you think they should do that here in the United States? I mean, yeah. The fact that other countries are are doing it, and the fact that we still haven't done that, we haven't done it. Um, yeah, I'd say we should have free health care. Um, because since we pay so much to the government at this point. I think free health care is the least they could do. I, I would not disagree with you there. So let's talk about elected officials and term limits. So right now the only office that has term limits on it that I'm aware of is the President of the United States. He's allowed to have two four-year terms and that's it. Whether they're consecutive, separated, whatever. He's only allowed to have two terms. Do you think that should be the rule for all politicians, or is it okay that being the exception to the rule? So, I know your opinion on this already, and I'm going to have to agree with you there. 
I do think that other, um, that all political offices should have a term limit, whether, however long it be. Okay. Well, I'm glad we're in agreement on that one. Let's talk about campaign contributions and, and political campaigns in general. So, and, and I'm going to give a little background on this. So right now you have people that spend millions and millions of dollars on a political campaign to be elected to an office that pays maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. Do you think that campaign contributions distort our political system? I'm not entirely sure on this. Um, I've never really been asked this, and I still don't have a lot of background knowledge on it. Okay. Um, unless you wanted to explain a little more about it. Oh, I don't, I don't want to distort your perspective on there. I have my own very strong opinions about this. Um, but maybe this is something that we can revisit in a later podcast after you've had a chance to maybe do a little research on it. Okay. Voters. So voters are supposed to be the people that run the country through elected representatives. I I don't want to ask if you think our elected representatives actually represent what we want, but I will ask you, should the voters have more say in how our country is run? I'm actually going to go with a no for this one. Um, people have very strong opinions, and a lot of those... Con- and uh, uh, a lot of those opinions... Um, kind of go against other people's very strong opinions and the fact that there are so many people who believe one way and so many people who believe a certain way very strong the other way very strongly i'd say we'd come into a bit more conflict if we had more of a if voters had more of a say in how our government is run so i think now it's okay it's better to kind of have a little less of a say in the government just because so many people have so many different opinions and I think we would get into pretty big conflicts. It's interesting. It's a very, uh, very mature approach to the question. The last question that we did have here is another one about campaign. So one of the things that politicians tend to do on a campaign trail, which sometimes could last 12 to 18 months or longer is they make a lot of promises. They, they win voters over by understanding what voters want from their politicians and then promising or proposing ways to give that to the voters. So the question is, should politicians be held legally accountable for what they promise in order to get elected? So if, If a politician promises, I'm not going to raise taxes if I get elected, and he gets into office and he raises taxes, should the voters have some legal means to challenge him at that point in time? I mean, in that kind of respect, yes. Um, But I do think that in certain things they say, like, say they say something, but they make no changes... I don't think they should be legally accountable to do that specific thing. Like, if they say, like, if they say they're going to low, like, on the term of taxes, if they, if. Well, and I'm not saying, like, just take a step back. I'm not saying they have to necessarily accomplish it because there isn't a single politician out there that can promise something and make it happen by himself. But. You know, I'm saying if they promise to do something and they fail to propose legislation or move legislation or debates in that direction and they have absolutely no intention, like, for instance, um, taxes is a great one. All right. So uh, George Bush Sr., uh, he got elected. And one of his famous sayings when he was on the campaign trail was, read my lips, no new taxes. And one of the first things he did was impose new taxes when he got into office. So he clearly lied when he was on the campaign trail, knowing full well that he was going to raise taxes, but was just saying that so he could get elected. Under those circumstances, he went 
he was diametrically opposed to what he said. On, on the other hand, you have some people, some politicians that get elected because they want to give you universal health care. And they might get in the office and they might try to put a universal health care plan together and they can't get it passed and it fails. Well, they've it, at that point in time, they've put the effort in to try to fulfill their promise, but they couldn't get it passed. They didn't go completely against it, though. That's sort of the situation I'm talking about. Okay, so if I directly oppose what they would promised, I would say that they should probably be legally accountable for that. But if they do try and it doesn't happen, I don't think they should be legally accountable for that. Okay, fair enough. That was all we had in this segment. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about big picture questions. Oh, dun, boy. Dun, dun. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We are talking teen perspectives on big picture questions. So the first one that I have here is one that's all over the news. Is global climate change man-made? I'd say most of it is because a lot of a lot of the change in climate is due to us making factories and building more and um somewhat destroying the land. So I'd say most of global climate change has to do with us making it ourselves. Okay. The death penalty. Is the death penalty effective? For, mm, I'd say for the most part, no. Um, like, if you kill, if, like, you sentence a mass murderer to death, like, maybe that helps people, but when you do, when you kind of do it to, like, a murderer who only murdered one person, you're kind of just as bad as a murderer, if you really think about it. Interesting. Okay. Torture. Is torture ever acceptable? Uh, I'm going to say in certain instances. Wow, really? I didn't think you'd go there. <laughs> I mean, like... Very rarely. Um, I'd say that most people can be reasoned with, and if not, it would be better to remove benefits people might have, like putting them in jail. It removes their ability to go out, that kind of thing. I wouldn't say harming them in any real capacity would be good. So, for the most part, no, torture is really not acceptable. Okay. So the lottery, all right? So there is numerous, every state pretty much has lottery, and there's several lotteries that are multi-state, the big ones, your Mega Millions, your Powerball, stuff like that. Most of the proceeds from these lotteries tend to go to education or higher education or senior programs or stuff like that where they help to fund useful programs. Based on that, do you think a lottery is a good idea? Well, um, for certain people it could be, for others, not really. I know with certain lotteries, like the lottery we have here, we have to pay for lottery tickets. And the chance of getting anything from the lottery is very slim. 
Um, and I'd say that if you're, like, really desperate for money, I wouldn't go for it because you're, because there's a very, very slim chance that you're ever going to actually get a, like, the large, a large amount of money from it. So, but if you are financially stable, but want to, but want to get, um, some money to get, like, a better house or put it towards something else, then I'd say it's all right. Okay. Just don't expect to win. I, sad but true. <laughs> I'll give you that. So, animal research. So, a lot of industries, you have uh, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, the food industry, they use animals to do research on. Is uh, Should animals be used for research purposes? I definitely don't think we shouldn't be using them for research. You Hang on. But- you definitely don't think we shouldn't be using them. <laughs> That's a double negative. Okay. Could you clarify? <laughs> I think that researching animals can give us a better understanding of them, but I don't think we should take it to, like, an extreme. Like, if you want to research an animal's um, uh, autonomy, that kind of stuff, I'd kind of recommend maybe using an animal that kind of died off naturally instead of experimenting on a live one. Like, I'm just going to say, research them as long as you don't torture them. That's pretty much what I'm trying to go for. Okay. So humanely, animal research done humanely is okay. Yes. It's better to give an animal a rash than a human a rash if you're testing some cosmetics. Um, what? Well, that's what they do. So if they're testing a new cosmetic, a new chemical or something like that, they'll test it on an animal and they'll see what kind of reaction the animal has. If they tested it on a human instead, they could hurt the human. True. So that's really what the the research that I'm referring to is. Okay. Okay. Cigarettes. Should cigarette smoking be banned everywhere? Honestly, I don't really see any benefit to smoking cigarettes. Says uh, someone who doesn't smoke. <laughs> look, I'm I'm part I don't of, smoke either, so I'm part of a school that says say no to drugs and and always say no to any type of thing that can be harmful, and I've been taught that cigarettes are harmful. And personally, I don't know the benefit as a teenager right now who's never smoked, I really don't see the benefit of smoking. Other than okay, that's good. I'm glad because I don't want you to start smoking anyway. So they should be banned everywhere. Yeah. Awesome. I'm with you there 100%. So I'm going to put a, a phrase out there. You tell me if you're familiar with it. Do you know what a throwaway society is? Somewhat. I've heard of it, but I've never really gotten a clear definition. Okay, so in a throwaway society, you use things until you don't use them anymore, and then you discard them. Okay. Uh, In the 1950s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, we weren't as much of a throwaway society. If you bought a washer and dryer, then you used that washer and dryer for years. If it broke, you fixed it. If it broke again, you fixed it again. So it was one of these things where you had durable goods that you would maintain over long periods of time. Nowadays, when you're done with a TV, you know, you may buy a TV and that TV may be, you know, good for three or four years and then you decide, well, you don't want an HD TV, you want a 4K TV. So let's throw the old one out and buy a new one. That's a throwaway society. Uh-uh. A society that would prefer to just throw stuff away and buy new stuff than to keep what they have and reuse it. So, with that in mind, do you think we have a throwaway society today? In certain aspects, yes. In technology, absolutely. Like, technology can become absolute. So, like, a a TV made, like, two or three years ago can be outdated. So, I'd say especially with technology, we can definitely be a throwaway society, and we get rid of 
old technology that was probably just a year old, and then we get newer technology. And I guess the same can kind of be said for furniture, but pe- but I would definitely say it's more or less with technology than anything else. Yeah, with our furniture, it's the cat's fault that we have to get rid of it because they, <laughs> they tear it up. Yeah. But, you know, to, to your point, we just got rid of a TV that, that I had bought in 1999. You know, it was designed to last six, maybe ten years. And I had that thing almost 20 years before we finally well, And it would still worked. Yeah. So I'm, I guess, from that perspective, I'm guilty of being part of a throwaway society. But the problem I had was nothing worked with it anymore. So it didn't have any modern ports, any new piece of technology that we bought, streaming devices, video consoles, whatever, wouldn't work on it. Yeah, and that's the exact problem I'm talking about. Technology becomes absolute, like, almost, like, a lot, a lot, because if you try using technology from a longer time ago, you're not going to be able to use it in the modern day. Right. And that's the same thing with modern technology. You get something from, like, a decent amount of time, like, not, like, extremely long ago, but still long ago, you don't, it might not work with everything, and that's kind of the problem with yeah. society evolving. Yeah, and that's why we wound up getting rid of that TV. Question eight. Are actors and professional athletes paid too much? Uh, well, I definitely say actors more than likely are paid a bit too much. Um, because although certain actors can star in a lot of movies there it definitely feels as though they're they definitely get paid a a bit more than i would expect actors to be paid for um professional athletes i'd say that um i'd say that maybe their um the amount that they they get paid might be a little more reasonable, especially since um, if they're doing a sport like football where they can get injured and they need to go to the hospital in some instances. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. I was kind of thinking of that when um, I looked at this question. So That's a very good point. So let's switch that question up a little bit and say our CEOs, people that run these big, giant companies, are they paid too much? Um. Uh, uh, I'd say that, I mean, they get, in some instances, they can, in other instances, probably not. Um, but if they have, like, a pretty decently sized company that makes millions of dollars, I can kind of see them getting paid in a decent amount, um, but it's also not like, th- like, the CEOs didn't entirely found these, f- um, companies. They're, point, they kind of yeah. just run it. So I'd say some, in most instances, they probably get paid a bit much more than they really need to. Okay, fair enough. So the last question we have today, and the last question on our big picture category is does religion cause war okay i'm gonna go a bit deep here (laughs) um i don't think it's religion specifically that causes war it's the different viewpoints of religion that causes war like say you have someone who's christian and another who's jewish um and they both despise each other for their religion. It's not that they have a different religion; is that they? It's just that they can't accept that the per that the other person has a different religion. I think it's not religion specifically that causes war. It's just the fact that pe- sometimes people can't accept other religions. So it's intolerance that causes war, and that yeah. intolerance can be religion, could be race, could be the color of your skin, could be where you live. Could be your uh, wealth, could be anything. It's the intolerance that's the problem. Yeah. I think that's a very poignant observation. So thank you for your perspective on, on what we talked about today. I, some of these were very eye-opening for me. 
and uh and i think you uh showed me that you're a very enlightened individual when it comes to some of these things thanks that was all we had today though uh, we'll be back next week with another 30 questions in three different categories to get another per- set of perspectives from you. Before we go, though, I do want to invite folks to subscribe again to the podcast. You can subscribe to all of our video podcasts for all of our shows. If you look up Insights into Things, you can get just the audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher. Any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite folks to uh, reach out to us, give us your feedback. We're definitely looking for uh, topics for the show. We're, we're in the phase of putting together uh, our next series of shows. Please feel free to email suggestions over to comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can also get high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime member, you do get a free Twitch Prime subscription. It's a monthly subscription. We would very much appreciate you throwing that our way. It helps us out a lot. You can get audio versions of this podcast at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. You can reach out to us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can get us on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things, or you can get links to all those sites at our main website, www.insightsintothings.com and you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast hosted by you and my brother, Sam. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.